In the 13th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles there in the New Testament, in the middle of a speech given by one of God's children, we find a statement made about David, King David, that I'd like to share with you for a few moments this Sabbath morning. The 13th chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles, the 36th verse, if you will. Acts of the Apostles, the 13th chapter, verse 36. A rather short statement, but profound in its implications for us and its example to us. The context is a sermon given there to talk to God's people about some need, talk to people and encourage them to, to follow the Lord and to do what was right. And in the middle of that, the discussion is that everybody has a time that they live, but the only one that will spans a generation is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ will not see corruption again. And in the middle of that, it talks about David. And I want to jump on that little part, if we can, in the 36th verse of the 13th chapter of Acts. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. And I'd like to focus in with you for a few moments on David served his own generation by the will of God. The New English Bible reads it in a better way, I believe. David served the purpose of God in his own generation. How does a person serve? What is the process for serving? First is preparation. You know, it has been said, and rightly so, that the secret of every victory is getting good and ready. So if you want to have a victory in something, you prepare, you get ready. A ball team that wants a victory, they work hard on the fundamentals, they prepare, they get ready. If you want to have a victory in anything, you do your homework, you, you get ready. That is the way it is in a Christian life. David, of whom we talk about today, he did his preparation there with the sheep out in the fields in his, in his early life. Generals will tell us about war, that battles are not won on the day of the battle. But the battles are won and the strategy and such on the day before the battle and the calculations or miscalculations that may take place on that prior day. This text today is a complete biography, if you will, of David, found in the New Testament, this Old Testament man. And the first question that I'd like to ask as we look at David and we think about serving is... It's not how we make a living that counts, but how we make a life. You see, David served. When we think of service, the first tendency we have is, I'm going to give service, I've got to go out and get a job, and I've got to make a living. And I want you to sort of focus out on that just a little bit, and to focus in on serving being, being beyond that, that there's something more important than working and making a living. In fact, making a living is a merry incident in life. Yes, it's important. Gets food on the table. Gets transportation. Gets medical help that we need. It's important. But it is but a, a mere incident in life, really. Making a life is the main meaning, and the earthly experience that we have and the mission that we have involves us serving outside of that capacity. Our highest gift to our generation you say, what could I give to the generation around me, to those around me? The highest gift that we could give to them is that we serve them, be of service to them. Ten righteous men, I remind you, could have turned the Sodom and Gomorrah back and the destruction not taken place. Just ten righteous men. In making a life, certain principles are, have to be faithfully followed and Given here in this brief biography of David are those principles, and I'd like to share them with you if you look at that text. David served his own generation by the will of God. First part that I'd like to share with you is that David served. The second part is the spear of his serving. He served his own generation. And then thirdly, he served his own generation by the will of God. The first business of life is service. And when you talk to young people today, 
you get concerned about that. Because we live in a materialistic society at which the young people are being pushed as they go toward life and, and that the main thing is in the making of the life. The main thing is to making the life successful. The main thing is in the accumulation. And it gets away from the real focus of service. Christ said, by their fruits ye shall know them. By the way they serve, by the way I serve, by the way that you serve other people, we will be known. Christ was the one that lived the ideal life, and it was said about him that he went about doing good. And someone has said, why is it that Jesus went about doing good, and that's a record of him, and sometimes his people are just satisfied with just going about, and the good not taking place. The divine emphasis is on deeds. Gladstone, the great British historian and statesman, said, one example is worth a thousand words. We've heard a play on that, and people say a picture is worth a thousand words. But where it came from was when Gladstone said, one example is worth a thousand words. What the world needs today is service. Wounds can be healed by service. Wrongs can be corrected by service to a cause. Injustice can be corrected to justice by service. And ignorance can be overcome by service. It is by service that we show our faith in the business, in the home, in society, and in the church. The ever-recurring question of Jesus is why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I tell you to do? Why do you say Lord, Lord, and indicate by saying that, that I am your master when you don't serve me? Why do you do that, he says? You see, faith grows and matures in service. We want faith, but faith does not operate outside of service to others and to Christ. Witness, for instance, Moses in the Old Testament and Paul in the New Testament. Men who, who, great men of faith, wrote a lot about faith, but they were great men of deeds and action. And Christ reversed the standards of service in his day. Look at it, if you will. He didn't give little answers to, uh, to big questions. He gave big answers to little questions. A clever lawyer came up to him and said, uh, uh, who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered with, that, answered with that classic for all times, the story of the Good Samaritan. That's who your neighbor is. Whatever the hindrance, whatever the difficulty, whatever it is that we like or we don't like, service is the name of the game in the Christian life. Service is the name of the game on this planet Earth. That is a key that pulls it all together. If you take the service out and you just have the making of the life out, then you have a great gap with no real standards beneath it. Let's look for a moment at the world's standards of greatness when we think about that. First is physical. We have been through stages in this world's history when the physical was everything. You remember Hercules and and uh, the great strong and muscle man, and people really worshipped his body. I can remember as a kid Charles Atlas and the, the advertisements on the back of the comic books and such, and if you write in and in 10 days you can become, and we'd write in and, and we, we, we didn't become. The only way I ever grew is when I got older and started getting fatter. The physical, we've looked at that in the world and said that that is a standard of greatness, that that is a standard of service. Uh, Armies come and, and defeat other countries and might makes right. Those type things take place. The medieval Europe, the, the knights with their armor coming and, and knocking the other ones off their horses and coming and defeating each other. The physical, if I'm physically stronger than you, then I am great. But there is something higher than that, and that is in the area of finances, for instance. That has been regarded as great, uh, uh, great in the matter of service that I can serve with finances. Chief Justice William Howard Taft of the United States Supreme Court once said, The true wealth of a nation is not financial and material, but moral and spiritual. And he was right. Tennyson, the poet, said, Ill fares a land to hasten in ills of prey where wealth accumulates 
and men decay. Financial standards that we face in life are powerful and important to us, but they are not the chief standard of greatness. Then we could look at another that's higher than the physical or the financial, and it is the intellectual standard. Some would say no. Well, there have been individuals across the face of Earth's history, many individuals that have been blessed with much wealth. And there have been individuals that have been blessed with no, but they have taken the pen and they have wrote. And they have influenced this world in a tremendous way by that pen and by the knowledge. Knowledge is powerful. Knowledge gives us the ability to make decisions based off that knowledge. Someone can be out and they don't know much about Christ and they don't know much about the truths of the Bible and they can come to something like a revelation seminar and it can, the Sabbath and things like that can be presented and that knowledge, that sudden knowledge throws them into a different category, doesn't it? That I could try to pump, uh, I could try to get them to pump irons and gain weight. I could try to teach them ways in which to make more money. But the giving them of the knowledge gives them a greater focus there. But without an army, without means. Paul, Moses, others influenced. Bunyan with Pilgrim's Progress, other great literature, literature works that have come across the stage in Earth's history that have influenced mankind came by intellect. But that is not enough. All of these things are not enough. Christ said that the cheapest of all must be servant to all. That's the key. The cheapest of all must be the servant of all. And that's the hardest thing that I have to remember as a pastor. My chief ingredient to be your pastor is to serve you. That comes the hardest. Your chief ingredient as you work with me is to serve each other. That comes the hardest. All power that we have, whatever it is, is given to us by God for the purpose of service. For the purpose of service to our mankind. Whether it's physical, financial, social, intellectual, you name it, it's given for that reason. It is correct what Paul said in the New Testament. I am a debtor to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to the wise and the unwise. Can you believe what he said there? I am a debtor. To the Greeks. Now the Greeks were the intellectual geniuses of that day. Not so with the barbarians, not really. They were these wild, marauding people that would come in with not much uh, education, not much in the worry of social graces and such. These barbarians that would come in and yet they were looked down really if someone was civilized at all. They were looked down with disdain upon these barbarians. And yet Paul said, I am a debtor to these barbarians. To the Greeks of wisdom. And strength, and they stress the physical exercise and such. And to the barbarians, I am a debtor. A debtor. Just, just what does it say when it says, when Christ says we are a debtor? Paul says, I am a debtor to these people. Just exactly what it says. I'm in debt to. How many of you are in debt? Now I've got your attention, right? We owe ourselves to others. That is the greatest debt that we have. Not some credit card that we went out and spent too much on. Not some appliance that we bought that we shouldn't have bought. Not that car, that home, that education of our children that we're trying to pay for in a Christian school. That is not the debt. The debt is that we owe ourselves to others to serve them. How shall we pay the debt? How shall we invest our lives? We can take the miser's view of life. We can hoard it all in. And we know what happens when someone hoards it all in. They end up, what Christ says, a tree that cumbereth the ground and must be cut down. Or we can be a spendthrift. And that's worse. Take everything that's given to us and don't use good judgment. Just throw the money out and waste it. The prodigal son did that. Or we can take this example of David. David served. I'm glad he did, aren't you? David served, and I've got the book of Psalms with all the wonderful comfort and the counsel of the book of Psalms where David served God and his generation. David's example was whether one talent, two talents, or five talents, you still serve. 
And we have seen David served. Now let's look for a moment at the spear of service. David served his own generation, the text tells us. And we can sigh wistfully about the past. And we can remember things about the past that were great. In fact, we can try to serve in the past, but it doesn't work. It's gone. Or we can dream sentimentally about the future. I like this one better because the past is not as good as I hope the future is going to be. But I I want to reach out and I dream sentimentally about the future that things are going to be better. Finances are going to be better. Relationships are going to be better. Love, experience, everything is going to be better. And I can dream sentimentally about it and I can allow the present to go unimproved. The spear of service is that David served and he served his own generation in his home. In his business, in his job, in his church, he served his own generation. Now, David served. David served his own generation. And then the last part, David served his own generation by the will of God. Motive. His motive for serving was the will of God. That's where it is. Motive gives oxygen to life. Selfishness gives carbon dioxide to life, if you will. Motive takes something and, and moves it and, and moves it into great capacities and great things and great admi- admiration. Life is dominated by one of three motives, if you will. First, the lowest is selfishness, where it's like carbon dioxide poured into a system is what happens to us and it leads not to happiness, but to ruin for others and ourselves and organizations and homes and churches and uh, selfishness just ruins and decays and puts that carbon monoxide in it. Selfishness in any form sooner or later withers and blights and it's like we were worried about the frost last night. Uh, It looks like the Lord blessed and we didn't get much frost. A little ice on the windshield, but the plants seem to still be okay. The Lord bless. But you know how what happened? You know what would have happened? We know it's, we've seen it happen before. If that frost came in and that heavy freeze and it just got on those plants and they just wither and decay and die and the orange blossoms and everything else. That's what happens in selfishness. The second motive is higher than the first. And it's the motive of giving of ourselves. Because people share Many blessings follow. When we share, blessings come. Much help is given because we share. Sharing makes many things happen that could not have happened without that sharing. But that sharing is not strong enough for the trials of life. And human nature is often forgetful and ungrateful later on. You can give to something and then later people don't remember the good that you did. People whom Moses sought to help, at the t- in the very time that he was seeking to help them, what did they do? They spoke evil of him. Uh, soldiers of David, when David was uh, this man, David, who served his own generation by the will of God, soldiers of David, when he was working with them and they knew his motives were right, they actually talked of stoning him when things went bad. But I love David's response. You remember what it was? It says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. He encouraged himself in the Lord. Moses' response when they talked about him, he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He didn't have to look at any human being. David and Moses and others, when things have gone bad, they didn't have to look at any human being because their basic service was to God. And any service that went out to their fellow human beings was a service motivated by God, motivated by the will of God. And therefore, when they did something, it didn't, it didn't necessarily matter how it was received by people if it was motivated purely by the will of God. What then is the greatest motive? And our, our text has it. David served his own generation. By the will of God. God has a plan for each one of our lives. If our motive is to do His will, how will we come out? We will come out following Him. In each one of us, God has a plan for our life. He has a plan for our home. 
He has a plan for our job. He has a plan for our church. God has a plan. That plan may not be what I feel it is or should be, but God has a plan. And we have to ask ourselves Pilate's question many times. What shall I do with Jesus? Jesus says, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. You see, the issue of obeying or disobeying God or Christ is inevitable to every one of us. Inevitable. You can't dodge it. You and I are faced with obeying or disobeying God in the matter of service. He calls us to account. And there's this issue that came face to face with a young college man years ago, and he wrote something called, When I Met the Master. I share it with you. I had walked life's way with an easy tread and had followed where comforts and pleasures led until one day in a quiet place I met the master face to face. With station and rank and wealth for my goal, much thought for my body but none for my soul, I had entered to win in life's big race when I met the master face to face. I had built my castles and reared them high with their towers, had pierced the blue of the sky. I had sworn to rule with an iron mace, and I met the master face to face. I met him and knew him and blushed to see that his eyes full of sorrow were fixed on me. And I faltered and fell at his feet that day while my castles melted and vanished away. Melted and vanished, and in their place naught else did I see but the master's face. And I cried aloud, oh, make me meet to follow the steps of thy wounded feet. My thought is now for the souls of men. I have lost my life to find it again. And ever since that day in a quiet place, when I met the master face to face. And how do we serve? In our own generation, motivated by the will of God. And that way we can do his bidding. Since I started My life he bestows Since I gave my heart to Jesus The longer I serve him The sweeter he grows Oh.
the floor. 